welcome inside the Broncos Media Center for Broncos Country Connected. It was the battle of the banged up when the Broncos and Browns met in primetime Thursday night. And unfortunately, it was Cleveland's third string tailback, Ernest Johnson, who stole the show. Johnson was an unstoppable force, barreling through the Denver defense for 146 yards while averaging more than six yards per carry in his first career start. For the fourth straight week, the Broncos offense couldn't find a rhythm until her backs were against the wall. The Broncos found the end zone twice in the second half, but those scoring drives took more than 13 minutes combined, which subsequently didn't leave enough time to complete the comeback. Here's a look back at Thursday night football between the Broncos and Browns. Windy, cool night in Cleveland, 61 degrees, wind gusts up to 25 miles per hour tonight. Everybody wants to play in these primetime games, and we got one. Thursday night coming around, I wanted to put it on me. You know, I wanted to put the pressure on me. It's a great opportunity for us on Thursday. We need to play better. There's no getting around that. Tonight, the Broncos are on the road in Cleveland, Ohio, to face the Cleveland Browns. They have guys banged up. They're playing on short week. When we have guys banged up. We're playing on short week. We want to make sure that, you know, as a team, you know, we're locking in and having that laser focus mentally. Four-man pressure, Keenum a deep drop in the pocket. Cooper, I thought, had a sure sack, which would have been his first. Teddy rolls away from Clowney, throws a ball, then is caught on the sideline. Getting both feet down as Gordon was up. That's a gain of 14. On third down, end zone, pass picked. Keenum under center and runs into his own offensive lineman, and he's going to be sacked. That's Shelby Harris. Teddy throws the ball in the flat. The ball caught. Gordon leads to the goal line and has a Denver touchdown. And it gets him right back in this Thursday night game. Keenan bounces around and now decides to run it. And is hit and still makes the first down. 11 play drive thus far. 60 yards worth of territory. That is the first catch of the night for Eric Sauber. Williams the hurdles to the end zone. Touchdown, Denver. So the Broncos, again, hard fought in Cleveland, but they come up short. And this one is over. And the Browns win it by a final score of 17 to 14. A frustrating loss for this franchise, no doubt. Thanks to FanDuel Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris is here to help us get a better understanding as to what went wrong in Cleveland and some of the things that we need to see more of here in the second half of the season. Now, Ryan, when it comes to things I really need to see more of and want to see more of here in the second half of the season, this 50-50 ball to Cortland Sutton. It was amazing. This is a career highlight catch, too, for Cortland Sutton. He's going to be right at the top of your screen right there. And one of the things to notice, too, we talked about a little chalk talk let's talk some more coverage last week we saw off coverage well this week we are going to see man-to-man -man coverage this is what they call press coverage those corners are right on the line of scrimmage which also lets Teddy Bridgewater know that the second that Cortland Sutton can make a move he's probably going to create some separation so on the snap of the ball the first thing we're going to see is great protection by the offensive line got to mention that and then Teddy Bridgewater going up high and with one arm, just pinned against his one arm, Cortland Sutton brings it down. A lot of receivers make excuses. A lot of receivers look for referees to help them out, but not Cortland Sutton and not on this play. You love that kind of effort. A play like this gets the entire offense jacked up and ready to play. I also want to show you something else that happens on this play. A little bit of foreshadowing for the rest of this show. Kendall Hinton's been fantastic all year long, but you're going to see as well, Kendall Hinton's going to be right here in your picture. This is what they call a got him move, okay? And the receivers will actually say on the field, got him, real loud, so you'll know as a lineman that something big's about to happen. So you're going to see here, oh, Kendall Hinton got him. He lost him in the drift there. You're going to see some more Kendall Hinton as this show goes on. Kendall Hinton is a bright spot for this team, and it's fun to see him work even on a big play like that to Cortland Sutton. You want your quarterback to have multiple options. Yes, a 31-yard connection between Teddy Bridgewater and Cortland Sutton to set up a much-needed touchdown at the end of the first quarter. However, Bridgewater, he wasn't able to connect with John Brown in the end zone. Yeah, and what's tough about this play is I think any quarterback might throw this interception. The key here, even though the ball is going to be deep, is this linebacker. As the play develops, this linebacker is going to play underneath in the zone. But Teddy Bridgewater thinks that this defensive back here is going to have to cover the entire field. 
Well, that's where Teddy gets it wrong. As the play develops, you're going to see players moving over, and all of a sudden, Teddy's expecting this to be covered by the defensive back here, but really this linebacker has this part of the field. So when Teddy Bridgewater sees the, the defensive back start to move towards Cortland Sutton, he thinks he's good to go, but unfortunately, that's an excellent move there by the Browns defensive back. He kind of baited Teddy Bridgewater into throwing it deep because he knew he had underneath help. And if Teddy Bridgewater had just elevated the ball a little bit, about five, six inches, that might be a touchdown for the good guys. But unfortunately there, Teddy Bridgewater just didn't see that that backer had the underneath coverage that he didn't believe he had, and that's how that interception was made. All right, Ryan, it's the first drive of the third quarter for the Denver Broncos. They're looking to string together their first scoring drive of the game, and it's Teddy Bridgewater to Kendall Hinton for a much-needed first down. And this was a big play on that drive. First things first, the Broncos are going to pick up the blitz with this linebacker, but this play really happens because of Kendall Hinton. I talked to Rod Smith one time as I was practicing my wide receiver routes. And I said, Rod, what makes a great wide receiver? And he said, make sure every route looks like a go route. That way you scare the defense. What you're going to see is Kendall Hinton in the slot right here. He's going to force this defender to move off the line. And the second that defender backs up, he's going to be open. And it only happens because Kendall Hinton's going with so much speed. He looks like he's going deep downfield. So watch as the bit blitz gets picked up. But then as soon as this defender backs up, Kendall Hinton knows he's open. And then he gets down. He covers up the football. That's showing just those little details that coaches love to see. You threaten the defense. Even though you weren't going deep, you couldn't tell what route he was going to run Got because it. of his speed and his determination. And that's why little things like that are why Kendall Hinton has been a great bright spot for these Broncos. Great work there by Kendall Hinton, eventually setting up Melvin Gordon for a touchdown early in the third quarter. But now let's go ahead and move along to the fourth quarter to Ernest Johnson. He was a problem for this Denver defense the entire game, but especially in the fourth quarter when they needed to stop him most. Yeah, you still had an opportunity to win the game here, and this is going to be what they call a power run. You're going to get this guy to pull over here, this tight end. Usually that's a fullback, a smaller guy, but the Browns are trying to win the game here. They want to seal it, so they're getting one of their bigger bodies up there. Where the issue becomes is Jonathan Cooper here. He's going to kind of play outside. Anytime you see action coming to you, you want to collapse that gap. You want to get closer so that there's less room and the running back has to get depth to go outside of the defense. Well, on the snap of the ball, you get too much movement right here. I mean, this is a gap already because Jonathan Cooper's playing a little bit outside. And once you see a gap like this, this spells problems. Now, Justin Simmons can fire into that gap quickly, but he doesn't get there fast enough. And as, as Dearness Johnson gets around the corner, he sneaks through, and then you got one, two, three, four, five Broncos it takes to bring him down. You never want to see that at such a pivotal moment in the game. That was the backbreaker. You can see Kareem Jackson in that play, kind of devastated and frustrated. That's where you lost the game, right at the end when you had a chance to get a stop. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate you. Always. Well, coming up after the break, Ryan will join Denver 7's Lionel Bienvenu and Troy Rank to preview what to expect as the Broncos host the Washington football team this Sunday. But first, here are some memorable moments from Thursday night captured through the lens of team photographer Gabriel Christus. Welcome back to Broncos Country Connected. After four straight losses, the Broncos now sit at three and four at the bottom of the AFC West. This Sunday, the Washington football team makes its way to the Mile High City, looking to snap a three game slide of their own. For more on what we can expect as these teams go head to head on Halloween, let's check in with the Denver 7 crew. Here's Lionel Bienvenu. All right, thanks Alexis and welcome to our Denver 7 segment brought to you by 1-800-GOT-JUNK. All righty, Broncos insider Troy Rank is here and Super Bowl 50 champ and former lineman Ryan Harris is here as well. Guys, we got another home game coming up Halloween Sunday against the Washington football team. Broncos coming off a mini bye week as players had four days off after the loss last Thursday in Cleveland. Ryan, let's start with you. I mean, me and Troy were youth all-stars in football, <laughs> right? But you actually played in the NFL, so... Yeah, you're the guy. Hey, look, as a player, what do you do with that time? Four days off after a loss? Time off is welcome, right? All of us at our workplace would love 
four days off. You get away from the kind of routine and the grind. But some players were staying to get treatment to make sure that they can get healthy. But either way, what fans miss is that you actually get to watch football on Sundays. You get to see what your peers are doing, and you get to remember why you love to play the game. Coaches, though, don't have that time off. Coaches do not, <laughs> thankfully. And, and hopefully what coaches do is that they spend that time self-scouting and really learning what do we do well at and where do we need to improve. All right, Troy, uh, after the loss of the Browns, we heard Vic Fangio say, especially on defense, that the team was lacking in fundamentals, and they have to coach that a little better. But that's a group effort, right? I mean, it, fundamentals, if you're there to make a tackle as a player and you miss a tackle, that's on you. But if the coaches have you out of position or have the wrong defense called, that's on them. So everybody has to get better. Well, they've got to find a balance because when you say as a coach, we called the right play, but we didn't execute it. When you keep saying that, then there's somewhere there's a disconnect. So you need to simplify it to your personnel. Now, they've had some injuries that have caused issues, especially at linebacker against the Browns. I mean, they had 13 missed tackles total. That can't happen. But if I'm Vic Fangio and you look at the film from the last few weeks, I think you simplify the defense and also look for ways to create pressure and takeaways. They only have six Lionel, if they're going to get their offense back going and give their offense a jump start, it starts with defensive takeaways. Well, we're talking about getting some help on the way, too, as well. Getting some key players back from injury this week. And also, George Payton made a couple of moves, bringing in a couple of linebackers via trade. Kenny Young is a starter for the Rams. They're trying for the Super Bowl, and they trade their inside linebacker who has almost 50 tackles, a couple of sacks, including one this past Sunday. He's a guy that knows the defense because he played it under Brandon Staley. I'm telling you, I wouldn't be surprised if he starts this Sunday against Washington because of his familiarity with the scheme and the season he's having. Young Kenny Young coming in <laughs> for the defense. Ryan, we saw a lot of tight ends make huge impacts last Sunday. It was National Tight End Day. So we got Alberto coming back. Noah Fan had a good game in Cleveland. You're a big Noah Fan fan. Yep. Jerry Judy's coming back. What can we look for on offense this Sunday? Well, more explosive plays, number one, Lionel. I mean, Albert O is probably one of the most explosive players behind Jerry Judy on this offense. He's a little more Travis Kelsey than Noah Fant is. He has that speed downfield, especially with the confidence he was gaining before his injury. I look for that to be a huge impact on this offense. And then Jerry Judy coming back. What welcome news to a Broncos team on a four-game losing streak. He can take the top off of a defense, and he was really producing at a high level before his high ankle sprain. Well, the Broncos will honor Peyton Manning at this game. Coming back, you were on the team with Peyton winning the Super Bowl. Uh, they honored Mike Shanahan and Steve Atwater at the Raiders game. That didn't help. But do you think Peyton will talk to the team, and could this provide a spark too? Well, Peyton might talk to them that Friday before. Usually when you have guests, they come in and speak a little bit. But being around Peyton Manning does make everyone better. You'll see that on the broadcast that he does as well, right? Uh, other, <laughs> other, other networks are doing very well with the ratings that when he's on them. So you love the impact of Peyton Manning, and you love that the organization is recognizing one of the greatest players to put on a Broncos uniform. All right, guys, let's do this. Troy, give us your one key. The one big thing the Broncos have to do to beat Washington. One, you're slighting me, Lionel. I've got two. Get the ball. Running out of time exactly. here, buddy. Yeah. Get the ball to Jerry Judy. He's better in space than NASA. Throw the ball to Jerry Judy. See what happens. The second thing is play like the ugly guy in the fight. You got nothing to lose. Your nose is crooked. Your eyes bloody. You got nothing to lose. Let it all hang out. Try to get back on track. I like that. You did slip two keys in there. <laughs> Good. Well done. Ryan. What about you? Well, you got to start running the football. It was insane to see that Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon had 12 carries combined. To give you an example, Dearness Johnson against the Browns had 22 carries. So you can't let somebody who's never started a game rush for more attempts than your two star running backs. They got to run the football early and often. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Now, as you've seen every week on the show, Denver 7 sports anchor Nick Rothschild takes us behind the scenes, behind the face mask with Broncos players. This week, he got together with Jonathan Cooper, a seventh-round pick who had three heart surgeries before he even ever set foot on the field at UC Health Training Center. As Nick shows us, heart is what Cooper's all about. You know, the doctors would talk to me and they would tell me, like, hey, like, there's a potential risk that, you know, you might need a pacemaker and you could never play football again. Football was life for Jonathan Cooper. But football was also signaling death. My chances of like, you know, suddenly boom, you know, like something could happen with my heart and I could just die like suddenly. 
His heart had an extra electrical pathway. Leaving it untreated could be catastrophic. And I thought about like my future and like my family and um, the stress that they would put on them, like to watch me play football and knowing that at any second I could like up and go. Let's go. Let's go. Family calmed Cooper's mind as doctors burned a new pathway through his chest. But mine was like right next to like an important part of my heart. So if they like did it too hard, then it could cause heart block and I can get a pacemaker. The surgery was a success and should be his last. But life has a funny way of rearranging priorities. I just like broke down, man. I, that's a feeling like I can't even describe it, man. Just like seeing like your, 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 your see, like your life, you know, like that's you. Cooper's now a father. His son Javier inheriting his relentless spirit, inheriting his heart. What would I want him to do in this situation? You know, how do I want him to act when he's in front of people? How do I want him if he goes through like hard times? Football is still his passion, but it's no longer his life. It's gonna make me a better father to my son one day so that I know how to handle whatever he goes through. I, I feel confident in myself that like, no matter what he goes through, like your dad has been through some stuff. So like I can like guide him. And I mean, if, if that's what me going through all this stuff is for, then it's all worth it. What's more important to you now, Jonathan Cooper, the NFL linebacker, or Jonathan Cooper, the father? The father. Uh, that's always going to come first. I'm a, I mean, I'm a father first, football player second. Still to come here on Broncos Country Connected, learn more about the Broncos second year wideout Jerry Judy, who's set to make his return to the lineup this Sunday. While the list of injured starters on Denver's defense continues to grow, there is good news for this Broncos offense that is expected to get one of its most dynamic playmakers back this week. Second year wide receiver Jerry Judy has missed the past six weeks with a high ankle sprain suffered opening night. But according to coach Fangio, he is medically cleared and will practice this week in preparation for Washington. So as we look forward to his return to the lineup, who better to highlight for this week's player spotlight than number 10, Jerry Judy. With the 15th pick in the 2020 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Jerry Judy. I just feel like the game of football really brings a lot of excitement. Being on the, on the field, it just relaxes your mind off everything about life off the field. So. Uh, I just like the excitement, um, the family, the brotherhood it brings. Um, one trait you have to have, you, you really got to be mentally tough, you know, and you really got to love the game of football. Just want to learn each and every day, never being complacent, and just enjoying the game, you know. Every year it's something different to be the better version of yourself in football. Little league to high school to college and now to the pros, you know, you just got to trust the process. I run a lot of my routes smooth. A lot of people say I'm a, a smooth route runner, so I just, I'm going to just go with that. Smooth. Picked up, Locke throws a ball middle of the field, and this is a catch and a big run. 45-40, this is Judy, inside the 40, inside the 35. There's a huge play on third and 16. My favorite route, um, I like a slant, because you can run it on uh, different variety of ways. Um, you can sell the go route, come up and lead, um, take it inside. Uh, uh, you get, they got different ways to run that route. I would like to say my first career touchdown, but I don't think that was my favorite touchdown. My favorite touchdown was when I took it off uh, for like 93. It's caught Jerry Judy on a gallop to the 40, 45 midfield. Judy down the sideline, 35, 30. Foot race, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Denver. I'd probably say that's my favorite career moment. Which team I look up to the most? We got a lot of great players on the team, a lot of um, good leaders on the team. So I already don't have no specific teammate that I look up to the most because we got so many guys on the team that like great leaders. You ready to come up? Is you ready to become an op? I just told him to get some cleats on, just, just go. What position you play when you play, coach? Safety. Safety? Oh yeah, you would've got routed. Let's make plays, you know, and do what we do. Be great on three, be great on three, one, two, three. Yeah. Oh, you mic'd up and you hear your pass clacking? Yeah. I like that sound. Like that? That's weird. 
I like to make music. That's one thing people don't know about me, really. If I just be freestyling, like uh, rap, joke around with the guys and stuff like that. My favorite quote was, just take advantage of every opportunity, really. That's probably the biggest quote for me. Just being able to take advantage of every opportunity. You know, because a lot of people don't get a lot of opportunities. So once you once you're in this spot, you just got to take advantage of it. Judy had six catches for 72 yards in his first and only outing this season, so keep an eye out for him to have an even bigger game in his return this Sunday. Well, that's all the time we have for Broncos Country Connected. For all of us here with the Denver Broncos and Denver 7, thanks for watching.